Okay, everybody, let's get started. I want to welcome everybody um, and thank you to Tony Pearson from IBM for helping us put on this webinar. Um, the first slide is to uh, kind of get a brief overview on Storecom and uh, telling you a little bit about who we are. Uh, Storecom has decades of data storage uh, experience. We are one of the top IBM storage solutions providers. We've built uh, custom tailored solutions that revolve solely around security. So we're extremely well versed in the security environment. Uh, we also offer public, private and hybrid cloud as well as on-prem solutions. Uh, so basically, we can give you a turnkey hardware and software uh, along with license offerings. And we also specialize in designing and integrating new solutions. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, I'll take over for here. Um, in case anyone doesn't know who is IBM, I, I'm actually surprised how often people have not heard of IBM. Uh, we've been in business since 1911. Uh, we celebrated our 105 year anniversary, uh, 110 year anniversary actually. Um, and uh, we have had the most US patents in the last 20 years. I myself have 19 patents uh, and am considered a master inventor at IBM. We are leading hybrid cloud company. Our focus has been on uh, integrating traditional IT infrastructure with private and public clouds. Uh, one of our major acquisitions was Red Hat uh, to make that possible. So when it comes to cyber resiliency, we like to use this concept of uh, the boom. And the boom is when uh, the public is notified that a organization, a government agency or corporation has been hit by ransomware or some type of uh, threat. And uh, you see that there was a lot of activity prior to the boom, uh, oftentimes uh, phishing emails or infiltration of some kind through malware or maybe a disgruntled employee was able to uh, release uh, credentials to get inside the system. And they might have notified law enforcement. They might have uh, tried to do things internally, but at a certain point, um, the public is notified. And then you're dealing with now a crisis response, uh, dealing with uh, the lack of uh, confidence in your company, your organization, uh, social media presence. Um, getting in the newspapers or on television, uh, generally uh, being on the defense. And so IBM has a variety of storage options um, that range from having application-aware snapshots that are local and isolated, isolated being the key word here and that they are separate from uh, the production systems. You'll also see the term NENR. Uh, NENR stands for non-erasable, non-rewritable. Uh, this is actually a government term. Uh, it was coined with SEC 17A-4, uh, which allows us to use the concept of software enforcement to prevent uh, data modification and deletion. We have traditional worm media, write once, read many. Uh, such as tape and optical. And then we can have uh, a cold data vault. Uh, and this is often referred to as an air gap where the data is physically separated from the production system, both in distance and uh, electronically. It's, it's not accessible electronically. Somebody, uh, for example, tapes in a vault would have to go into the vault, take the tape cartridges out of the vault and take them to some place where there's a, a tape library, tape drive. And so that huge gap uh, cannot be overcome electronically through uh, other means. And it's a, a, another form of isolation and separation. 
So I'm going to talk about three things today. Uh, first one is access control and how access control can be used to help uh, with cyber resiliency. Uh, secondly, uh, encryption and secure arrays to protect unauthorized access to the data. And then lastly, being uh, data immutability, uh, the idea that we can have data that cannot be tampered with uh, during an attack uh, in any way. So let's start with access controls. Access controls uh, determine who can do what with what resources, uh, such as uh, installing and configuring new equipment, controlling, managing it, uh, displaying reports about it, uh, reading the, uh, uh, the settings, modifying or updating the, the configurations, <coughs> or possibly even removing or disabling it. Some of these would require a high level uh, authority and others might need low level authority. And this is where we have now role-based access control. If you think about it, uh, in the past, before role-based access control, either you had to individually give each person, each employee, specific credentials and specific access to each and every resource, uh, which became unmanageable, uh, or you gave everybody uh, levels of control um, and role-based kind of solves both problems. Uh, it allows you to assign access control based on the role uh, and then all the people who have that role get that level of access. So it's a much easier to manage, easier to administer uh, because you can you know, work with groups of people and groups of resources as opposed to individual people with individual resources. This is also necessary for multi-tenancy. Multi-tenancy is the concept that you want to divide your environment up into separate domains or zones that uh, each one is independent of each other. I mean, the classic example is if you are a cloud service provider who uh, provides support for both Coca-Cola and Pepsi, two rival competitors, and uh, you don't want the folks at Coca-Cola accessing any of the data or resources that Pepsi pays for and vice versa. And the idea here is that multi-tenancy is also used in government agencies to separate uh, green zones, yellow zones, and red zones, and different administrators have access to each. Um, in some regulated industries, uh, electricity, uh, or finances or whatever, there are often cases where a company might have to treat two or three divisions separate from others um, because there is some kind of regulatory requirement that says that, uh, say, investment banking has to be different than consumer banking or uh, distribution of, of energy has to be different than the production of energy or healthcare providers have to be different than the healthcare payers. And some companies have multiple roles that have to be kept separate from each other, at least somewhat independent instances from each other in that regard. Let's take a look at encryption. Our second uh, theory is uh, encryption. And in the same way that we had in role-based authentication, if we had to give everybody the encryption keys for every resource, it would be difficult to manage. And we've already seen this problem solved by realtors and landlords when they have to show off apartments. Uh, if you have a, a 50 apartment complex, for example, you're not gonna carry 50 keys. Uh, instead, you have one key that opens a lockbox on the doorknob, and then that doorknob has that key for that particular door, and you can then uh, show off the apartment to a prospective person who wants to come in. And so you only need one master key uh, to get into any of the doors. And we've done the same thing uh, with encryption. Uh, we will have different data keys here uh, highlighted in red, um, and the data key is typically unique for different groups of data, but then we wrap that key uh, with a master encryption key. And that means that 
with a uh, decryption key, I can open up the lockbox, get the data key for that particular piece of data, which could be unique, and then access the data specifically. So it's implemented differently for different IBM storage devices. Uh, for example, uh, with Flash Systems products, uh, each Flash Core module, which is each individual flash drive, it has its own self-encrypting key. And that key is, is uh, uh, assigned at the factory. Uh, same with the DS8000 product line. We have a self-encrypting drive. Each drive has its own key assigned at the factory. For flash systems and Spectrum Virtualize that uh, virtualize other storage, uh, we have a key assigned per storage pool. And for enterprise tape, we have one key per cartridge. So each cartridge has its own uh, data key. We then have the advantage that we can have a public and private key pair to access a full system, uh, or in the case of uh, tape libraries, uh, one or two key pairs per cartridge so that we can uh, send cartridges from one uh, place to another. Our third category is data immutability. And uh, people have heard WORM, they've heard immutability and uh, the different terminology here. And the idea is that we want certain data to be prevented from being modified and prevented from being deleted. And in some cases, prevented from being deleted for a specific period of time until either a specific date in the future is reached or after a specific event happens. Uh, let's take, for example, uh, paying off your mortgage. Um, you know, you could say it's a 30 year mortgage, so I don't want any records deleted about this mortgage for 30 years. Or you can say, well, if the mortgage is paid off sooner, say after five years, I want to be keeping uh, the data related to this mortgage for two years after that, so seven years total. Um, that is a typical way laws are written that say that uh, to comply with either uh, industry regulations or government regulations, that you can keep that data unmodified and intact for the length of the time that it's required. Ransomware will often try to specifically attack this data, either uh, modified by encrypting the data uh, or delete it altogether um, and render it unusable to the customer involved. The target victim would then have to uh, either recover the data or pay a ransom fee uh, to get the decryption key to get the data back. So to help with that, IBM has delivered a feature called Safeguarded Copy. Uh, Safeguarded Copy was first introduced in the DS8000 product line and is now available on our SVC, our StoreWise, and Flash System products as well. Uh, the idea here is that a prediction system could have uh, safeguarded backups taken. Uh, these safeguarded backups are not addressable. They're completely hidden. They cannot be mounted. You cannot access them in any way. Uh, the only thing that can be done with safeguarded backup copies is they can be used to restore to new volumes data at a specific time point. So you can go back to previous time points. Uh, we give you 500 recovery points so that you can be very uh, detailed in your recovery process in the event of a ransomware attack. Tony, this is Dave. Um, yeah, I, I thought I'd, I thought I'd chime in here. I, I mean, I think this is one of the areas where we see that technology, the safeguarded copies, becoming uh, more and more relevant. I mean, we, we do this within our backup infrastructure, um, doing immutable copies for backups, right? For that, that's been kind of. I mean, we've done a number of webinars just this year alone talking about that with Veeam, how we do 
you know, uh, you know, immutable copies, meaning, you know, a, 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 a copy of data that can't be altered in any way for your backup purposes. But now you guys are really taking this to the next level because on primary storage now, in essence, you're giving people that same capability saying, hey, I now have a snapshot, which is in essence what this is, which, you know, all storage vendors pretty much have those capabilities. But now you've take, turned it into, into a format that you can actually use for auditing compliance purposes also say, hey, this has never been altered and can't ever be altered. And the only way it can be altered is by, or, or the only way it can be used is by, by in essence, restoring that data um, back to the original location. Um, so I think that that, that is, um, you know, although these technologies are, are not new to the storage world, I think what you guys are doing with IBM, um, at IBM with this uh, is gonna be a game changer from the standpoint of, of really being able to take not just backup data, but primary data also to the next level. So Absolutely. Well. Absolutely. No, I agree. Uh, thank you for that, David. Um, that That's a good point. Uh, if you look at it, historically, uh, the original uh, was worm media. And uh, the way uh, uh, the lawyers consider worm to be uh, is media specific, uh, optical and tape that have specific changes to their chemical structure that prevents them from being modified. Uh, that's true for optical platters like DVDs and CD-ROMs. Uh, and it's true for tape cartridges that have uh, specifically implemented uh, 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 media, the, the actual tape media itself cannot be <clears throat> rewritten. Um, right. A lot of people use worm uh, to refer to file and object storage, uh, flash, disk, and object in the clouds. Uh, but uh, legally, uh, the U.S. government does not consider those to be worm. Uh, it, rather, they use the term immutable to differentiate that, that uh, immutable means that there's some software that prevents deleting or modifying the data. But uh, if you bypass that software or some maybe administrators might have the authority to uh, reset or change the dates or, or reactivate some data uh, in that regard, uh, then they could do that. Uh, and then so the problem was when it got challenged to court that there was a lot of laws that said that some data must be stored on worm media. And people said, but that prevents us from using this new immutable storage available on flash disk or object storage. So the U.S. government solved that problem by saying to preserve the records exclusively in a non-erasable, non-rewritable format, that includes both. So that people can now support a variety of both hardware-enforced worm and software-enforced immutable storage. Um, however, Nenner is really a U.S.-only term. Uh, I don't see it used in Canada or Europe or, or Japan that often. Um, and you'll often see Nenner slash immutable or Nenner slash worm, uh, just so that people recognize one or the other terms. So the nice thing about safeguarded copy is that we have separation of duties. The people who are allowed to create and configure the safeguarded copies are different than the people who have access to the contents of that data. So uh, that's all implemented through role-based authentication. And uh, it's a good way to prevent one person from being able to access both. Uh, the protected copies cannot be mounted. It cannot be read directly. They cannot be written to directly. So it's a, uh, they are compressed, thin provisioned, images of the data to reduce the amount of space it takes up. So think of them as delta images uh, of the updates and changes. If you, uh, if it was doing backups every day, it would be just the changes on Monday in one group and just the changes on Tuesday and just the changes on Wednesday and so on. And we maintain 500 copies. So we will constantly be merging the older copies together uh, so that we have 500 uh, data points to restore from, which can represent a, a good variety for uh, being able to do the restores. The details of the supported hardware, 
Uh, Storewise, the 5100, the Gen 3 of the V7000s, our flash system product line, uh, our SVC uh, models, the DH8 and the newer models. Um, you do need Spectrum Virtualize software. The 8.4.2 is the newest release that includes the support. Uh, you will need Copy Services Manager that handles uh, the uh, role separation that allows the copy services to be separate from the storage administrators. You will need the flash copy license. I put an asterisk here that the flash system products already include flash copy as part of the base. So you don't need a flash copy license for the ones in the flash system product line. And uh, you do need a CSM license, which normally is included in spectrum control. So if you already have spectrum control, then you already have CSM. And really, I just tell everybody, Spectrum Control Select uh, is perhaps something that we can recommend for every storage sale, and it includes the CSM license, so they're already positioned to take advantage uh, of this support. It's fully policy-driven. Uh, you get to uh, determine the volume groups that you want to protect. Uh, you can be selective about this. Fully orchestrated copy services manager has all the automation to handle uh, the initiation and management of these 500 copies. Uh, the repository is using a child pool, which is a standard feature that we've had for several years now uh, on the uh, Spectrum Virtualized software that's running on all of these hardware products. And it's really easy to deploy as CSM walks you through it in a nice GUI uh, you set it up, and you're up and running very quickly. Good information, Don. Yeah. So, and and if you look at what happens after the boom, or even you know before the boom, is you need to validate. Uh, you might want to make sure that your safeguarded copies contain the data you expect them to do. So, just like in a disaster recovery exercise, you could restore data from three days ago and verify that everything that you need in the event of a ransomware attack uh, could be uh, restored. And uh, people are now doing this. So in, in addition to a disaster recovery exercise, they're doing a ransomware mock recovery exercise. Um, this also can include forensic. Uh, this is where you're trying to explore what data got corrupted uh, and what data has not been corrupted, or you might look at where the corruption happened uh, by restoring uh, different data points, uh, you know, a week ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and see where it happened. On average, it takes 60 to 90 days from the time hackers infiltrate a system to when they actually encrypt your critical environment. And during that time, they can wreak havoc in a lot of other areas. And this forensic uh, review uh, can help with that. Offline backups, we have seen people who have uh, taken the safeguarded copies and created a fully uh, running system offline that can be plugged in and turned on as needed as a uh, temporary measure. Uh, you know, so think of it as, uh, you know, last week's data, fully running database that you could run off for uh, a time while you're doing forensics or recovery of your production system. Uh, you can do a catastrophic recovery, and this would be like a disaster recovery where you're recovering everything because you have nothing to uh, <clears throat> go with. And then you can do surgical recovery where you might pick and choose specific volumes uh, specific files, uh, databases that were individually corrupted. Um, you might want to get those uh, recovered individually. Um, and so that's uh, another big plus. I think, these, Tony, I was going to say, I think these are all, you know, those are all really good use cases. And that's where, maybe, Absolutely. Store, you know, Storecom, if there's more information that folks want, I know we're getting close to running out of time here. Um, but, the you know, these these five points here, um, you know, just like the offline backup is an example, you know, being able to run your production systems while forensics are done on the, on, on, on what may have happened in the environment is a great use case. Those are ones where we can dig farther into, you know, what the customer's architecture is in place today 
and how a solution like, like this would be able to be implemented to help solve some of that. Um, exactly. So I just want to kind of throw that out there. Um, I just want to be cognizant if we got a couple of minutes left here. I'll let you kind of finish it up here, Tony. And okay. Hopefully. All right. So um, here's where Storecom can come in and help uh, and combine the storage with other solutions we have. Storage Insights helps you monitor your environment. Uh, we have Q Radar. Uh, Q Radar is a dashboard that it looks for anomalies, um, early signs of attack, and then Guardium, which provides um, basically a detection of real time monitoring of what data is getting accessed when. And uh, these can be helpful in uh, the before the boom activities. Uh, for looking for data that is being accessed uh, unexpectedly. So, yes, we're out of time here. Um, any questions? Uh, we've got two minutes, I guess. Um, uh, Heidi? Yeah, we had a couple of questions. The first one is how uh, can we analyze our cyber resiliency? Excellent point. IBM has two assessments available. Uh, a cyber resiliency assessment tool uh, is a two to three hour interview process where we go through and evaluate how you compare to best practices. Um, that's offered at no additional charge um, and gives you just a quick high level view of your environment, similar to uh, going to the doctor for your annual physical and they do blood work just to see how your cholesterol and, and blood levels are. Uh, maybe your, your A1C sugar and, and see if you're diabetic or not. Uh, same idea here. You, you, we go through this process and then we have a second offering. Uh, it's fee-based, which goes into a deep dive on cyber resiliency to address maybe specific concerns you might have. And we can then identify uh, what uh, needs to change and how do you need to harden your environment. Awesome. Thank you. Well, that concludes our webinar. Thank you, everybody. For Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. All right. Take care, everyone. Be safe.